David Aragona here with my usual co-host, Craig Wolkowski, and we're looking ahead to Saturday's card at Fairgrounds, kind of beginning their road to the Kentucky Derby. Obviously, their prep series runs through races like the Risen Star and the Louisiana Derby, but we're going to kick things off this week with the Lecompte on Saturday, the final race on a marathon 14-race card down in New Orleans. Uh, we're going to discuss the late pick five sequence on this podcast, which runs from races 10 on through race 14. Typically in past years, Craig, I think this has been an all stakes sequence, but they've tried to spread these stakes races out a little bit throughout this fairgrounds card on Saturday, maybe to space out the turf races a little bit. So this sequence actually kicks off with a maiden race that's one of the more interesting races in the sequence. But then we proceed on to four stakes races, including two for the three-year-olds, the uh, Silver Bullet Day for the three-year-old Phillies, and that LeCompte, which I mentioned, is a grade three event for the three-year-old males, which offers 20 Kentucky Derby qualifying points to the winner. Yeah, they've changed the points around a little this year, making this one a little more valuable. I, I think that's actually a good thing to make these earlier races a bit more important. In the past, you could win a race like the LeCompte, and it wouldn't get you into the gate. And I think if you do here, uh, it's a pretty good chance you're going to be in. Uh, I do like the maiden race that they chose. There's a slew of mo maiden races early on the card, but if one of them had to be in the sequence, I do like the one that we're going to start with. Now, this sequence is planned to comprise four dirt races and one turf race. We'll see if that holds. Uh, there is rain predicted in Louisiana on Saturday, so we'll see if they can keep these grass races on the turf. I know that they've had some issues with the fairgrounds turf course that limits the field size. They're only running on the outside part of the course with the rails way out into the center of the course, so I'm sure they don't want to let this course take too much abuse if there is plenty of rain, so we'll see if the 11th race uh, that Duncan F. Kenner, if that stays on the turf course, but we're going to talk about it for dirt and turf since I think there are some runners that are kind of entered as faux MTOs in that race uh, but as I said there are four stakes races it does begin with a maiden race which as Craig said is one of the more interesting maiden races on that Saturday card at the fairground so Craig let's dive in to this pig five sequence and begin with that 10th race and lucky for you as a speed figure maker they've carded plenty of two turn dirt races on this card and this is one of them going the mile in the 16th distance and it's hard to know where to start here because it seems pretty wide open open i guess the number eight mobster is a horse that could take money having finished second last time to banishing a horse that probably would have been among the favorites in the lecompte but he'll be running one race earlier in an n1x allowance race yeah, that's a solid race. Mobster comes out of what looks like a pretty strong race, but Banishing did beat that field pretty handily. There haven't been a ton of run backs back, so uh, it's kind of hard to get a true feeling. It was kind of a weirdly run race and that the pace was really fast early, seen the tail off a bit, and then Banishing just ran away from the field. So Mobster can obviously win, as you could probably say about a couple others in here. Um, and one thing to note, whenever you get these three-year-old maiden races this earlier in the year, particularly on a day like the LeCompte, an impressive win, and we could very well see a horse coming back in the Risen Star. That's the kind of steps these horses take. Um, a horse really caught my eye in here, and maybe I'm stretching. Uh, I'll be curious on your opinion, but... I'm landing as my top pick. I'll just dive right in on that. It's a three-horse presider. Uh, he's a horse who has run two basically pretty terrible races out of his three races. But the one that caught my eye is the one in the middle where he ran a 92-speed figure back in September. Uh, he beat some pretty good horses. That's proven to be a really strong maiden race. As several horses have come out to win out of that race. We see Cyclone Mischief, who finished behind him that day, came back to win with a 104 figure at Keeneland. And this is a horse who's working very well also. He laid off after that last poor effort, but I, I liked what I saw from his workouts, and I think he's going to improve off that 92. And I just think in a race that looks pretty wide open, he's one that might slip through the cracks and offer some big value. Yeah, I think you're going to get fair prices on a lot of horses in this race because it does feel like the money has to be pretty spread around. And I'll be honest, Craig, I had no idea what to do with Presider because like you said, 
two races he just didn't show up at all but he has that one really strong race at Churchill Downs I guess the one difference I would point out between that race and the others was that he was much closer to the pace and he was kind of kept outside in the clear he didn't have to deal with the kickback that he did in his debut and especially last time out at Keeneland where it just seemed like Cyclone Mischief dominated that race towards the front end uh, a horse he had actually finished ahead of in his prior start and Presider was just never involved in that race kind of racing outside the entire way so maybe he got a little bit discouraged getting Lasix on from an inside post position perhaps he can get that forward position so he's definitely one that you can consider speaking of horses who could be forward in the race I'll jump into the one that I would say is my top pick and that's actually the horse that's drawn right to his inside the number two Onasa who was going out for Larry Ravelli and I like both of this horse's starts that was a pretty quick pace that he was chasing on debut at Churchill Downs obviously that was just going the six furlong distance but while while the winner did wire the field, there were horses that were running from the back of the pack, kind of a blanket finish that day, and this horse never really gave up chasing inside down towards the inside. To only lose by two lengths, I thought he did, he did pretty well that day. And they stretched him out last time, but they did so on the tapita surface at Turfway. Who really knows if he's a synth horse? I think he, based on pedigree, is going to be much more of a dirt horse because when you look at his pedigree, uh, you should not overlook the fact that he has a real connection to this day and this series at Fairgrounds because he is the half-brother to Epicenter. So he's definitely bred to be a dirt router. And uh, I like the way he stayed on last time. He faded a little bit at the end, but for a first route attempt stretching out from the six furlongs, I thought that was a pretty good effort. And drawn on the rail here, you think that he's going to have to go from the inside and watch the few races that I have on the dirt at the fairgrounds it seems like inside position has generally been a good thing to have so I'm going to go with the number two Onasa here he'd be the one that I would lean on the most but there we could talk about almost every horse in this race Craig and make some kind of interesting case for them because there's a lot going on yeah and I don't want to like I like your horse as well he would be my second choice maybe even a co-a for all the reasons you stated, I don't put a lot of stock in that Turfway race last time. It was an okay race. He actually improved his speed figure, but it was one of those races where he set the pace on a slow pace at, at Turfway. It was a day that was favoring closers. We have it uh, coated that way in light blue, so I'm just not going to put a lot of stock in that, and I do expect from improvement for him, and Larry Ravelli's been really hot. Um but I don't want to totally dismiss Mobster. I, I think he's can run just fine in here. He certainly wouldn't shock me if he won. He does have some speed. Uh, he's actually shown in front in the pace projector. Has improved every time out. So he is a horse I would definitely use. Um, the one that I was a little bit torn on was the entry. I, I never like an entry if both of them run because you're you're going to take the short of it on the value end. Um, the 1A in this race probably it doesn't have a lot of uh, upside. He didn't run very well first time out. Maybe if you think the trainer just didn't have him ready, which is he's not a big first time guy he could run. But of the shorter prices, I'm not as high on the entry. I think fighting ready, who's probably the better half of the entry, though he improved last time. He can't have out of a race with a slow pace uh, was not really making up any ground at the end, backing up to the runaway winner. And I, I just always feel those slow pace races kind of make horses look better than they are when they're up near the front end. Yeah, I, I agree with you about the entry. I don't have a whole lot to add. I actually like the 1A a little bit more because he struck me on debut watching that race as one that really is going to appreciate added distance. And I agree with what you said about the, the plain one fighting ready. He got a great trip last time, and I think he's a little dressed up off that race. So when I like the one that would be a bigger price if they were separate betting interest, you're supposed to be against an entry when the price is going to get driven down by a horse that you don't like. So I kind of have to go against them. And uh, there's a lot of ground that we could cover in this race, Craig. So I just want to quickly run through a few horses that I have some interesting notes on and then maybe you can react before we move on. Um, the number four, Baseline Beater, is a horse that ran pretty well two back at Churchill Downs, making up some ground in a one-turn mile. And last time out, he was in that fight and ready race, the one where he, that horse was second. He finished fourth uh, about eight lengths behind him at the wire, but Baseline Beater had the much tougher trip. He made a premature move around the far turn while going wide. And I'm not sure how much pace he's going to get to close into in this race. And he does seem like a pace dependent horse but he's one that I think is going to do a lot better here than he did in his prior start and will be a price um, the number seven single ruler 
maybe it's a little bit tough to bet this rider who hasn't had a whole lot of success at this meet, but he's another one that got a, a ridiculous trip last time if you go back and watch it. So he has some back form that's a little better than that. So at an even bigger price, he's a horse that I could see throwing into the mix. And then another horse that had a trip last time is the number nine, Two Rivers Over. He's a woodbine shipper, has never been on the dirt before, but his last race is one you might want to go back and watch because he was way too rank in the blinkers, fighting the rider for about a quarter mile, got a, a silly trip after that, more traffic in the stretch. I don't know how good this horse really is. His speed figures don't really suggest that he can stack up against these, but it is his first time on the dirt, so we'll see what we get from him. But just some price horses that I think you could throw into the mix somewhere because this is the kind of race where I'm not going to be surprised when the winner pays 20 bucks. Yeah, I, I actually, of those three, I prefer two rivers over the nine, trying the dirt for the first time. I just think he's more of a wild card. I'm a little more negative on the others. Baseline beater, I hear you about the trip. Uh, I still don't like that that race in general. And I just think he has no speed, which I think is going to be trouble in a race like this. Uh, he just tends to drop too far back. So while I think he's going to improve, I, I would be against him. And single ruler is another that was in that fight and ready race. So despite the fact he had trouble last time, uh, I still go back to that same race and didn't really like the way he gave it up and was couldn't even beat fight and ready that day. So, uh, yeah, of those three, the nine for me is the one that will be on my tickets. And neither of us mentioned the Steve Asmussen Stone Street first or the number six Kawaii Dan. Uh, this damn Kawaii Katie was a very good racehorse for Todd Pletcher, but she has not produced much to say the least. And this horse, they tried to sell. Uh, he was a $240,000 RNA at auction. So I don't think Stone Street chose to keep this one. Uh, I'm not I'm not going to take a horse like this for Steve Asmussen, who does not have great numbers with first time starters in dirt routes. Let's move on to the only turf race in this sequence, if it does indeed stay on the turf. That is the Duncan F. Kenner going the five and a half furlong distance on that grass course. As I said at the top, this field is limited to eight starters. And Craig, I don't know if Fairgrounds actually takes MTO entrance, but it feels like a couple of the also eligibles in here, particularly the number 10 surveillance and the number 11 Bango are kind of entered as MTOs. I doubt they're going to participate. Even if this race, you know, they were able to scratch into the field on the turf, they seem like more dirt intended runners, but we'll first talk about this as a turf race. And I guess Manny Waugh is where you have to start. He's the favorite on the morning line, but to me, he's a tough horse to take at a short price on either surface. Yeah, I agree. I mean, he obviously won the, um, that race at Churchill or the, the Phoenix at Keeneland that got him into the Breeders' Cup seemed like kind of a, a stretch. That was an incredibly slow race for a uh, grade two prep race that it was that day. And he seemed to run okay in the Breeders' Cup. He was only beaten two and a half lengths, but no offense to Elite Power, that Breeders' Cup sprint was one of the weaker versions we're ever going to see. And you could see it when he came back next time out. He was only four to one. I mean, normally in a listed stakes like that, a horse who was beaten two lengths in the Breeders' Cup is going to be three to five if he had the in a normal year with those kind of credentials. He didn't. He wasn't bet. He didn't really run at all. Uh, got a, another weak speed figure. So he's a horse I am definitely against in here. And I'm glad you mentioned he also eligible. So just so I can clear that up on my end real quick, if for some reason this is switched to turf, it, turf or dirt, it would be the outside two horses for me. And that's it. I wouldn't even use Manny Wah. Yeah, I agree with that. If this race gets contested on the dirt, uh, I I like surveillance. I would use Bango. I probably prefer surveillance a little bit, uh, but I think they're much the two horses to beat on the dirt. Um, and we don't. I don't think we have to spend a whole lot of time talking about that. Um, on the turf, I think that there are some other ways to go. Kind of a weird horse in this race is the number five Angustin, who has only started once since 2019, uh, and it's now 2023, so we have not seen this horse in action recently at all, um, but he did win that one start in 2021, and he has a, been a horse in the past that has run well fresh, but boy, it's hard to take this horse now as an, a, an eight-year-old who has competed so infrequently, J just a huge question mark in this race. Yeah, I don't like a, a lot of prices on this card. I mean, there's some mid-range horses we already talked about in the maiden race. So I'm going to be against the two favorites in here. I, I I have a feeling people might see that last, that long layoff. He came back to win another long layoff and assume he can do it again. But 
for me, that's a, a pretty terrible sign. This is a horse who ran pretty regularly both times in his career before he had layoffs. I know he won that last one, but he's now eight. He's not six anymore. He's not five like he was when he came back before. And I just think taking a short price on this guy would be pretty silly. And I don't want any parts of him. On the turf, I love Evan Singh in this race. Uh, he, he, To me, he's a very likely winner. I know he's six to one on the morning line. I'll kind of be surprised if he goes off at that high a price. Uh, but I, I just think he makes a lot of sense in here. There does appear to be some speed signed on towards the outside. And he is one of these one-run closers, or at least he's become that in his recent starts. But this is a horse that I think is better than he looks on speed figures. He put in a big effort to win at Saratoga three back. And that race has been flattered in retrospect because the runner-up Thin White Duke has gone on to win stakes after that. And I'm not going to hold the Kentucky Downs race against him. He just kind of got too far back that day. And then last time out at Keeneland, I don't know what was happening, but Leperu just showed no urgency towards the back of the pack, and he never had a chance to be involved from where he was, and it's kind of miraculous that he even got up for third that day. I think the long stretch at Fairgrounds is really going to suit this horse, running down the center of the course, which has been the place to be on the turf at Fairgrounds, and I, I think he's a likely winner on the turf. You and I like the same horse. Darn it, David, you jumped in before I could say <laughs> it. But no, that's that's okay. Uh, this is a guy, if you just look at his turf sprints, he obviously tried routing a couple times. He ran okay, but I think he clearly showed that he is a very good turf sprinter. Like you, I'm tossing those last two rides out. The Kentucky Downs race, horses were having trouble making up ground there. Um, and it's just that weird course, so I'm always willing to excuse that one. And last time out, that... To my eyes, that was just a terrible ride. I don't know what Julian Leperu was doing. It seemed like he just fell asleep back there. Um, and like you said, he was making up tons of ground at Keeneland, a much different race course than this one. So for me, he is definitely the A horse in here. Yeah, and like I said, I don't think he's going to be six to one. I I, I think he's going to be more like three to one, maybe even five to two in this race. But I also believe he's the most likely winner. So to me, that that's a fair price uh, to use him pretty heavily in a pick five sequence if this stays on the turf. Let's move on to race twelve. It is the Silver Bullet Day. This one's for the three year old fillies, one of the early preps for the Fairgrounds Oaks, going a mile and seventy yards and. This is one where I think we're going to have a strong favorite here, Craig, in the number five, Chop Chop, going out for the Brad Cox barn. And I kind of went into this race expecting to take a skeptical view of her. But when I went back and watched that trip in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies, I kind of didn't realize how little chance she had based on where she was on the racetrack. That was one ugly journey. I mean, I laugh. It was sad if you bet that horse, which... Uh... I mean, she was like the hot steam horse of the whole Breeders' Cup weekend. I know a lot of people liked her, but I never thought she'd get that down as heavily as she did. But like you, I'm willing to put a line through that. I'm not willing to just concede the race to her, though, because she is a horse that just doesn't have a ton of speed. I do think she'll get help by the much smaller field, given her style. I, I don't think she'll, she's obviously not going to have to work out much of a trip. She should be able to find one. I, I think she could win, but I don't want to totally hand it to her. I think there's a couple horses in here who are, are coming into their own as well, and I'm going to use on my pick five. The one is just to her inside, the Alice look, I assume that is. Um, She's one who broke her maiden a couple back going wire to wire. Showed me a little more in the allowance last time where she was able to come from off the pace. Showed me some versatility. She's really improved her speed figure his last two races. Uh, she sprinted first time out. Didn't appear to like the slop second time out. But whatever it is, she's really come to hand. Ran the 98 last time, which is right up there where we, Chop Chop had run in her stakes win. So I don't want to totally dismiss her. And a horse who would have to improve a bit. But look like she could just uh, about three weeks ago, I guess it was, maybe a month ago. Uh, no, three weeks for Jason Barkley was Forrest Chimes. She only ran an 88 speed figure that day, but it's not all that far off of these. I like that she gets the outside post in a small field. And I was just really impressed with her stretch kick. Uh, she did get some pace to close into that day, but she just visually looks so good that I have to have her on my tickets. Yeah, I'm going to be a little bit more willing to eat this chalk than you are. I I'm going to lean pretty heavily on Chop Chop here. Uh, if she runs back to her Alcibiades, where she finished right between 
Wonder Wheel and Raging Sea, who, let's remember, were also the first and third place finishers in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. Uh, I mean, she'd be one to five in this race if she had run like that in the Breeders' Cup. And I'm not saying that she was ever going to win that race because, I mean, she lost by 15 lengths and she finished, I think she finished last. But, I mean, let's remember, she's coming out of 14 and 13 horse fields and she's not a horse that breaks that sharply. So when you're a horse that has some slight gait issues and you're in a congested pack like that, I mean, it's just going to be difficult to work out any kind of trip. And Joel Rosario did a great job in the Alcibiades and it was just the total opposite story last time. And you sometimes see those chart comments that say five, six wide and you watch the replay and they're exaggerations. This was not an exaggeration. I mean, she was literally six wide around the far turn last time. So, I mean, she just had had no chance to get, be competitive in that race, especially in that mile and a 16th configuration at Keeneland where so much of the races run around the turns. So uh, I think Chop Chop is a very likely winner of this race, especially because she has real ability in class. And I'm just not so sure about some of the others in this field. I have some questions about how strong of a race that untappable really was, though I agree the Alice look is the only horse I'd really want out of there. And you're right, the up-and-coming interesting horse is Forest Chimes, but she got a perfect trip last time on debut. It's it's a credit to her that she was so professional, but I mean, everything worked out in her favor that day from the pace to where she was early in the race. And also, just looking through the horses that finished behind her, there really wasn't a whole lot in that field. So she's going to have to step it up against some tougher competition here. And uh, I'm going to rely a little more heavily on, on, on Chop Chop. Yeah, I can see that. Maybe you convinced me. Just going to convince, uh, depend how much I want to spend on this, how deep I go. And I will use the others. It's just a matter of on what tier. Let's move on to race 13, the grade three Louisiana stakes going a mile and a 16th, same distance as the LeCompte, which we'll get to in just a little bit, but this one is for the older horses, and we've got a field of nine in here, Craig, and a lot of deep closers in this race, not too much speed signed on, so I think we have to look to this pace projector and kind of start the conversation with the horse that is expected to be in front, not that he's some need-the-lead type, but the number two run classic just looks so much faster than everybody else in the early going. Isn't he supposed to have a massive pace advantage here? I think he's going to have a pretty good pace advantage, but I, I do think the eight has some tactical speed. Zozo's who we're going to get to, I'm sure. Um, maybe that gap's a little exaggerated, though he hasn't shown it lately. Zozo's has ran pretty quick at times. That's why he's not shown terribly far back. But Run Classic definitely has a, a little bit of an advantage, but I'm... I know he's run okay around two turns. I still have trouble wrapping my head around that that's his absolute best distance. If he's going to get it, it's going to be in a race like this where he's alone on the front end if that's what happens. But I'm just a little skeptical of him as a horse. I hear you. Uh, I will say these mile and the 16th races at fairgrounds, it feels like the turn comes up very quickly a lot of the time. And he's got that inside post position, whereas his other two main pace rivals are drawn to the outside. It just feels like if Brian Hernandez is remotely aggressive with this horse, he's going to have an advantage going into that clubhouse turn. And I agree that I really don't know how far he wants to go. I would say I wouldn't want him going any farther than a mile and a 16th, but we see a lot of times in these races at the fairgrounds, even with that long stretch, uh, if a horse gets away with some moderate fractions, they can be pretty tough to catch. So I, I want to respect his chances. Uh, I'm not going to, I won't say that he's necessarily my top pick in this race, but I think of the shorter prices, he's the one that I would be most interested in because I mean, let's remove, move right on to Zozos, who I think is going to be the shorter price of two Brad Cox trainees in here. And his return race, I thought, was okay, but it wasn't the most impressive performance for a horse who had such a reputation as a three-year-old early in the season and was coming back as the three-to-five favorite. It was It was a little bit of a strange trip that he was so far back early. Yeah, I was a little confused with what to do with him. In the end, I wind up, I kind of like him. I, I'm going to use just him and run classic in this race where we're happily we'll talk about some others but i came away with a little different view he was three to five that day i actually thought on paper that was kind of uh, almost an overlay maybe fair i guess is a better word because he just really looked like he towered over that field and i think he was kind of ridden that way where he was just kept outside off the pace maybe they were trying to teach him something i'm not sure but 
once he kicked it in, uh, it was pretty obvious he was going to win, I thought. And I liked what I saw. Brad Cox doesn't always bring him back fully cranked up first time off the layoff. It's kind of tricky. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. In a spot like that, he generally doesn't when it's just an allowance race. And I think this horse is going to move forward. He has actually run a little bit faster as a three-year-old, and I should say a, a pretty early season three-year-old when he won the Louisiana or was second in the Louisiana Derby behind Epicenter running a 118. And any kind of improvement off of that figure is going to be very, very tough to beat in this field. Yeah, I I hear what you're saying, and I actually wrote down a stat from Formulator that totally backs up your your viewpoint on this horse. Uh, and uh, second off a layoff of five to ten months, or 150 to 300 days, with horses that won their last races, so won their first start off a layoff, and now are second off that long layoff. Brad Cox is 17 for 41. That's a 41% win rate with a 280 ROI. So he is getting these horses to step forward, surely, second off a layoff when they win right back. And I I, I, I might look it up right now, but I believe those numbers were even better in route races. So um, he's... I get it with Zozos. I mean, he's he seems like uh, the horse that could take a step forward and has the upside out of all of these. But I also think he's going to be a relatively short price in here and... He, he still has to prove it to me. He's got that one big race in the Louisiana Derby from last year. I don't love any of his other races. He was okay last time, but at a short price, I, I want to take a, a wait-and-see approach with him and go for some bigger prices in here. Um, another horse we should talk about, Craig, is the other Brad Cox trainee, the number seven, Forza Dioro. And I don't know if I should make anything of the fact that Florent Giroux is on this one when you might have thought that Florent would reclaim the mound on Zozos, who he uh, had ridden in the Louisiana Derby last year. But uh, Brad Cox is going to be faithful to Corey Lattery, who rode him last time. Forza Dioro has back races that would make him a major player in here. It just feels like those happened so long ago, and you were hoping for a bit more improvement first uh, into the switch to the Brad Cox stable last time. Yeah, that was my problem with him. They they happened a while ago. They happened a couple barns ago. He's actually switched barns a few times, and he just ran okay last time. I, I didn't love that tenacious stakes, uh, the one won by Happy American. It was a, a decent race, but nothing special for me, and it just feels like courses like Zozos and Run Classic are probably better than what was in that field, particularly given the pace advantage they're going to have. Yeah, and speaking of Happy American, who is one of the favorites on the morning line, it just feels like he's going to have things working against him here. Whereas he got a pretty good trip last time, and I thought James Graham did a good job of starting his move earlier than usual so that he was able to get into position to win the race. It's just hard to envision enough pace materializing for him to be successful here because he is such a deep closer and he can drop so far out of his races early. Yeah, I did have a, when do you think he was gelded? He, he's being reported as gelded after his last race. I find that one pretty hard to believe. I, I would guess it was before that. I, I would hope it wasn't off the long layoff when he was gelded and it was missed for two races. It seems strange that he would have been gelded between these two races just four weeks apart. Um, you Often the reporting standards are not great at a lot of circuits, so it seems more likely he was gelded during that long layoff between March and uh, November when he returned, but we don't know that for, for sure. I, I haven't seen any reporting on that, uh, but it, it just seems like a, like a tough trip for him to work out, and I guess you could say the same for the number six chess chief, Craig, but you probably remember this is a horse that I've had some success with in the past, and I was looking at last year when he came in to the Tenacious Stakes and won it back in 2021. And just looking at his form coming into the race last year, and it was pretty, pretty poor. I mean, he looked pretty similar to the form that he's coming into this Louisiana Stakes this year. And I know he didn't run well when he got back to fairgrounds most recently last month in the Tenacious when he tried to defend his title. But... He's a horse that can be a little bit random at times. And I know somewhere in there, Chess Chief has the kinds of races that can make him competitive here. And he's always been a horse that has loved the fairgrounds. All five of his career victories are at the fairgrounds. And I just think he's going to fly under the radar here. A lot of people are going to be off his bandwagon. And he, he's a little bit interesting for me. There are concerns about the pace and the trip and the form that he's in. But uh, I'm going to go back to, to my old friend Chess Chief at a little bit of a price. 
Yeah, he's he's going to be every bit of a price. Uh, as a horse racing fan, I'm glad to see a horse like this not in the Pegasus this year, like he was last year after his win in the Tanisha Stakes. Uh, don't don't laugh at me, but I always want to call this the Tanisha D Stakes. Uh, I'm sure Jack Black <laughs> loves that, but I, I don't know why that sticks in my head. But yeah, Chess Chief, uh, I have no problem with you taking a shot with him. Uh, he's done it before. We know he likes the fairgrounds. Uh, I think all of his career wins have come at the fairgrounds, if memory serves. And I, I don't want to go without mentioning the number nine, Mr. Wireless, who just has a slew of competitive speed figures. He's got some tactical speed, so he's not going to be so outrun in the early stages. And you know, he seems to have a knack for drawing outside post positions. It's now happened twice in a row, but I think he could get into a decent position here if he's used a little bit aggressively from the start. And I mean, he's not my top pick in this race, but he's a horse that I want to have on my tickets because he has too many races in his recent past performances that would get the job done against this field. Let's close out this sequence with the feature race on this Saturday Fairgrounds card. That early derby prep, the grade three Lecomte going the mile and the 16th distance. And we've got eight runners signed on for this race, Craig. Brad Cox holds a pretty strong hand here, sending out two of them, Instant Coffee and Tappet's Conquest. Uh, I know Tappet's Conquest is cross-entered in an allowance race earlier in the day. I have been checking daily. I haven't seen reporting about whether or not Cox has decided to run that horse in the allowance or the Lecomte. I don't know if you've seen otherwise uh but uh maybe they'll make a game time decision about that but it does seem like instant coffee is the stronger of his two entrants in here and he's just the horse to beat, craig i think he's run well in all three of his starts and it feels like he could get some pace to close into here which would definitely help his cause yeah i think instant coffee he's a, a little bit of a tricky horse uh he had run some very nice speed figures broke his maiden first time out uh, at a pretty big price Thought he ran pretty well in the uh, Breeders' Futurity, losing to eventual juvenile winner Forte, among others. Um, and then came back to win that uh, Kentucky Jockey Club at a, a short price. But his speed figure regressed. But I don't want to read too much into that. That was a very oddly run race. It's a race we actually gave a, a pretty big pace upgrade to. The final time figure was only 88. He wound up with a 97 figure. And I'm not even sure that pace designation covers it. So... I'm not singling instant coffee. There's another horse I like in here a little bit more that I will probably use an equal strength or maybe a, a little heavier, but I'm certainly not writing him off because of that one. I, I think he's very dangerous here. Yeah, I agree. I'm not against instant coffee. He'd be my second pick in this race. Um, he's a horse I would definitely use in multi-race sequences. Uh, and everything you said about his last race, I'm in total agreement with. Uh, but uh I think there are some other horses in here that could offer a little bit more value than him. And, you know, I've stolen, stolen your thunder once already, Craig. I don't want to potentially do it again. So I'll let you talk about your top pick first. Okay. Yeah, may, I, I'm going to guess maybe we're the same, but I'm not positive. I'm not as confident on this one. Uh, I like the inside horse echo again. I know he kind of backed up in that Remington Park uh, springboard mile, or a race I was actually there for. But that was a fast race, in my opinion. He ran a 110 speed figure, which is the best anybody's run. Some people may question if he's a two-turn horse, because if you just look at these PPs, it looks like he backed up twice. But there was an allowance race mixed up in, which I think it's a shame it didn't make it to the PPs, because it wound up being a no contest. But it was a two-turn allowance race, and he was clearly going to win that race and win it pretty easily. So I don't have the concerns. Now, granted, it wasn't against a field like this, but I think it was going to come back a, a good race and good time. And I, I just don't have those doubts about the two turns. And he also looks like a horse who might be pretty clear on the front end. And as you've pointed out already, that's pretty dangerous in these fair fairgrounds races. So Echo, again, would definitely be my top pick in here. Well, we're not going in the same direction here, Craig. I, I actually don't like Echo again at all in this race. I'm, I'm tossing him. Um, I, I've kind of taken the opposite viewpoint of you. I, I think he's a horse that wants to go shorter distances. I was really expecting a better effort last time in that springboard mile. I know the speed figure came back huge. I, I It's one of those numbers I kind of want to see repeated. The, the, it, it, 
it's tough for me to believe that the runner up who got such a terrible trip in that race ran as big a speed figure as he did. And it was a big step forward for the winner too. So I'm kind of the jury's out for me on that last race for echo again. And I, he was so impressive in that debut at Saratoga. He was training like such a precocious horse. And I, I wonder if he's really going to be one of these two turn animals. I think he might be more of a, you know, it, it's a cliche to say this, but more of a Woody Stevens horse later in the year. We'll see how that works out. Um, but I'm, I'm against him here and I'm actually going with the horse that bookends the field on the other side. And that's the number eight, two fills. And he's one that I think could drift up a little bit from his four to one morning line, especially if this field holds together as is. Um, he's just a horse that I, I know he started off sprinting, but I think he's taken subtle steps forward in both of his route races, even though he lost that breeder's futurity two back. He ran deceptively well that day. He was wide most of the way. That was a, a tough post for him drawing the 12 hole in that that large, fully subscribed field. And I mean, that, the, the Breeders' Futurity undoubtedly was the the best uh, prep that we saw for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile last year with the likes of Forte in there and Loggins, who unfortunately has been on the sideline since then. But um, I thought he took a pretty good run around the far turn trying to make up some ground before fading late. And then last him out in the street sense, you could say he just freaked in the slop. But he had some real trouble in the early portion of that race. He was badly sawed off between horses going into the clubhouse turn. Kind of had to be put in, in behind horses, take some kickback on the backstretch. And once Jareth Ludbury wheeled him out to the center of the track to make that move on the far turn, he just inhaled the leaders and won that race so easily. He was even getting a little bit unfocused in green at the end, kind of flipping back and forth between his left and right leads. But I mean, he was in no danger of losing that race. And I know that was a, a weird track that some horses didn't handle and he was one who did. But I just feel like he's been stepping forward with every race. Larry Ravelli sounds like he's high on this horse. And I think he's going to get the right kind of trip stalking outside of a horse like Echo again. And if I'm right, that one doesn't really want the distance. I think two fills is going to be sitting in the right kind of spot to make that similar move to what he did last time in the street sense at the quarter pole. So uh, I like two fills quite a bit in this LeCompte. Yeah, there's only two reasons that two fills wasn't my top pick. One And both of them would be if you flipped them with the one. It's the post position and the morning line odds. Now, I'm a little skeptical that he's going to take more money than Echo again. So maybe that, that shouldn't have went into my thinking. Uh, just with the reputation Echo again has, I, I would be surprised if he's actually six to one. So maybe I would have to rethink that one. I do worry a little bit about being the far outside while the other one maybe gets a jump on him. But if I'm going to use a third horse, it, it would be that one. Uh, anybody else you, you wanted to use in here? I tried to make a case for a couple, namely confidence game, but I, I just couldn't quite get there. Yeah, I, I liked confidence games last race. I thought that he put in a pretty game effort to hold on to win that day. And the horse that finished right behind him, Rocket Can, I think he's okay. Um, but he got that trip uh, setting the pace last time, and it's hard to see him working out the same trip here with Echo again in the race. So I'm a little bit concerned that he might not be as effective from off the pace, though uh, he this trainer has won this race in the past, as you and I both know well, uh, from when they, they, he upset this with Call Me Midnight last year. So he can win this at a price. Um, just wasn't quite as confident with this one. And we should mention Tappet's Conquest, Craig. I mean, he, he hasn't run that fast yet, but... It's a sign of confidence, I guess, if Brad Cox does decide to go in this race instead of the allowance. And he's a horse that I thought actually showed a lot of potential in his debut. I almost liked his debut more than his last race at Churchill when I thought he beat a field that was just okay. Uh, but he's one that certainly has upside. Yeah, he does. Uh, I would be interested. To, I mean, obviously, we're going to know when the pick five kicks off, uh, if he's going to be in this race or not. I, I think that would actually show some confidence. Like you said, uh, if he's in here, he's certainly worth giving a look because while he's a little bit slower speed figure wise, that speed figure did come at the be beginning of October. We haven't seen him since he's been. But it, it seems like it was almost plain. He worked out a couple times after maybe something went wrong, but he's come back pretty strong since. So I'm I'm not totally against him by any means as for confidence game i am a bit against him in the end i like that last speed figure but as you said uh it's not one of those um running lines that that gives me a lot of confidence for this one where he's not likely to be on the lead and the other two times he was off the lead he was backing up 
Well, that wraps up the handicapping portion of this podcast. As we always do, let's do a brief recap, Craig, and talk about how we might structure these tickets. I think structurally, we're going to have similar uh, places of emphasis here, maybe using some different horses along the way, but I'll, I'll let you go first. Yeah, I really, my top pick in the first race, uh, which is the 10th race, would be the three horse presider. I just really like that maiden race where he ran well. Uh, it's one that I wish the winner would run back on third uh, just to get off track a little bit. There's a horse who won the race with a nice speed figure and has tried to turf twice since then. Sometimes I, I just don't get these guys. But anyway, presider, I would use a couple others in here baseline beater, mobster. Uh, and then I don't like the entry. That I think that about covers it. Don't like the Steve Asmussen first time starter either. In the turf sprint, I'm with you all the way. I, I really think that Evan Singh is the horse to beat clearly. Um, not sure I'd even use anyone else. We mentioned it. I guess there is a possibility it could be moved to dirt. If it was moved to dirt, I would just go with surveillance and, and bango and, and be done with it. Don't see any anybody else beating those two, even Maniwa, who I'm against on either surface. Uh, in the 12th race, you kind of swayed me a little on Chop Chop. I would use uh, her as the A and then use a couple others as BC types in the Alice look and Forest Chimes. Uh, in the next one, I really do like um, Zozos. I just think he's the best horse in here. Uh, I probably should have looked up the formulator stats like you did, but I, I just kind of knew it when you watch enough races like we do. Uh, but I was glad to hear it confirmed. I will use him, but I would also use Run Classic and maybe a little Mr. Wireless as a backup, like a C-type. And then in the last race, the LeCompte, Echo again is my top pick, but I'm not going to dismiss Instant Coffee. I will use two fills as a lesser, like a BC-type, and then maybe tap its Conquest if he gets into the race. Yeah, Craig and I are using a lot of similar horses. Um, I like uh, Larry Ravelli to bookend this sequence as I'll begin it with him with the number two Onasa. I like uh, him to potentially wire the field in that maiden race that goes as race 10. Um, I will use others in here, though. This is one of the races where I think you can spread a little bit. I would use Baseline Beater. I would use Mobster. I would even use the horse Craig mentioned, Presider, who I think is a little bit interesting, and uh, Single Ruler, who did not get the right trip last time. But they're backup types to me. I do like Onasa. Nasa to win that race. Um, Craig and I have a very similar opinion in the Kenner race 11 um, on turf. I'm going to focus on Evan Singh. Uh, and uh, we have the same two horses that we like on the dirt if it does come off in the Silver Bullet Day race 12. I'm going to lean pretty heavily on Chop Chop. I just didn't see enough in the bigger prices to really sway me away from this favorite. And I'm going to try to keep this sequence pretty thin. There are a few races where I want to spread, but there are others where I think I can go pretty thinly. And this is one of them in the 13th race that Louisiana I will spread a little bit here I'm going to use run classic I'll use my long shot chess chief I will even use Forza Dioro the Brad Cox trainee um, maybe Zozos with uh, the horse that I like in that first leg on a backup ticket and I, I do want to use Mr. Wireless uh, towards the outside he'd be probably more of an A or B type for me um, the more I, I think about it he, he just makes a lot of sense in here and fits the way that I'm viewing this race uh, so I would probably use five different horses in that Louisiana and then we'll close things out with the LeCompte where I do want to lean on two fills. I, I just, there's something about this horse watching his races that just makes me think he has forward to go. I, I, I like him here. I think we're going to see some progression from him uh, in the early part of this three-year-old season. I'm using instant coffee. He doesn't excite me at a short price, but I just think he makes a lot of sense in this race. And uh, I could potentially use a little bit of confidence game and tap its conquest as C types. But I mean, the bulk of my play is going to go through two fills. I did leave out Onasa in the first maiden race. He would definitely be on my tickets as well. So I think it's a good sequence. I do think if you're going to play it, you might want to take a nap at some point in the day because it's, it's just a very long card. Uh, I haven't even looked around the rest of the country to, to see what else is going on to keep my interest. But there's plenty of action going at the fairgrounds on Saturday. That is true. A lot going on, a lot of three-year-olds in action on Saturday, so hopefully we'll have a lot to talk about when we do the Timeform US Pace Cast next week. Everybody, thanks for tuning in to the Timeform US Forecast. You can always catch these podcasts on DRF.com, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Just make sure to subscribe to the Daily Racing Forum channel. Everybody, thanks for listening, and make sure to catch the Timeform US Pace Cast coming up next Tuesday.